The agenda this week assessed Canada's new food guide, learned why overpopulation isn't quite the issue some thought it was, heard how retirement living is due for a complete overhaul, and checked in on the state of partisan politics. The agenda's week in review begins confronting femicide in Ontario. Well, I think in Ontario, we have a great disservice that's happened in this province by the disbanding of the Ontario Roundtable on Violence Against Women. It was an opportunity to bring multiple people to the table from labour, student organisations, violence against women, domestic violence, sexual violence, together and looking at this issue. We had the Aboriginal Women's Shelters Network on there. Like, the thing is, is that this issue, what we know is that women go to multiple services to get support. They don't just go to a shelter. They're going to a counseling space. They're going to a sexual assault center. They go to five to seven different services. And all the services need to be funded. And right now, what we're seeing is a piecemeal of funding, a funding of only maybe domestic violence, like sexual violence is this dirty little sister secret. And we can't do that. You can't separate the two. You cannot. And you actually need to support that. And I know that sexual assault centers are still waiting to find out what's happening with the implementation of the Gender-Based Violence Action Plan that was released in March, March 1st, 2018. And they still haven't received their 33% increase. And there's no sign that that's going to change. Do you think that, do you think that the situation, um, because when new governments come in, sure. they are entitled to uh, focus on what they need to right. focus on. Um, do you think this is a partisan issue? No, and I think that's the thing we have to remind people all the time, that gender-based violence, the murder and femicide of women, the sexual assault of women, the sexual assault of children, right? We know one in three uh, girls, one in three women, and one in six men experience sexual violence in their lifetime. That's not a partisan issue. That's a people issue. And if we care about the prosperity of this province and this country, we have to care about this. We know that it costs our economy $12 billion every year. At least that's the status that we got a number of years ago. It's probably more now. It costs us $12 billion a year to not address gender-based violence. It doesn't help our economy. And yes, people can change power. It shouldn't matter what government's in power to recognize that this is a vital issue that needs to be addressed. And that's what makes me nervous. It shouldn't be like because it's trending, like, you know, me Too was a really big conversation that happened, but before Me Too was talking about Gian Gameshi, and before that we were talking about other things. Mm -hmm. Like it's not like this is not a new conversation. What we do need is every government from municipal to provincial to federal to look at this. In Toronto alone, where we are right now, you know, we had a huge mass murder of women during the van attack in April. Mm -hmm. And during the municipal election, we did not see any of the mayoral candidates speak about misogyny to the extent they needed to, to make commitments to end gender-based violence. In the federal election that's coming up, I want to make sure that our federal government is speaking about this. And it's not trendy. It doesn't not hurt one community over another. What we're saying is this is vital. People need to live and thrive in this province, in this country. So, Samara, I'd like to give you the last word. Mm -hmm. um, you were in an abusive relationship. You have a successful life now. Um, what message would you like to share with anyone who may be feeling trapped uh, or in an abusive relationship and is afraid to leave because of their children? So a couple of things. Um, from my own experience, as well as talking to a lot and a lot of people and um, just educating myself, I know that the impact of on children of experiencing or living with family violence, they don't just witness it, they experience it like it's happening to them. The effects of that trauma last forever. And I know that as a parent, that I'm supporting my kids through that and we're still healing and we're still getting help. And it's you know, you think that, you know, by I don't want to leave because my kids will live in a single parent family or I don't want to leave because they'll be separated from their father. That, yes, it is difficult for children when parents separate. But the, the trauma of living with family violence is an everyday thing. And that is much, much more detrimental. Um, so if there's anything I wish or any regret that I have in my life is I wish I could have left sooner for the sake of my children so that they didn't have to have to experience that uh, growing up. And I think um, the, the message is like, you know, for a lot of women, they, they, uh, they reach out and they say, well, it's so difficult to leave. And I will say, yes, it is. 
it is difficult. It is going to be tough because of just the lack of support, sometimes the lack of awareness, sometimes it's the cultural backlash, because even though violence against women is experienced across communities and cultures, but the experience of it, it could be quite different, and the cultural nuances are there, and the level of shame and stigma associated with, with walking away could be different from community to community. Yes, it will be difficult, and it's not going to be easy, and you can still do it. There are going to be support systems. Maybe not all doors will open, but some will. And there are people around you that will rally around you. Uh, and you just, just got to take that responsibility of healing and fighting and, and then find the right people uh, to support you and get out of it. And, and, you know, sometimes it's easier said than done, but there is to take uh, the first step. Yeah, take, the, take take the, the first step, step is the hardest, but it's also the most necessary one. Do you think that the farming industry needs to do a better job at marketing itself, or do you think that maybe mm. the it should be it should fall on the government? Well, that's a great question. And my organization, Center for Food Integrity, studies that. We ask Canadians, how well do you think the food system's doing on transparency? And farmers were at the top of the list, both for credibility, trust, and doing a good job. But the high number was only 34%. So, you know, even at school, if you're riding the bell curve, you're not going to pass uh, from 34 to a 50, right? It's still pretty low. And then it goes down from there. Food companies, retail, food service, and government is quite low. So I think we're in a really exciting place, and I'm sure your guests will agree that we have this opportunity to have a better conversation about food, a more robust conversation about food, how it's grown, social, environment, health, uh, including starting at the farm and working all the way through to what's on your plate or what's not on your plate in the cases of uh, people who are food insecure. And I, I, farmers absolutely want to be part of those conversations and they're optimistic about that opportunity. And, and Milana, your organization was part of the conversation. Um, what role did your organization play in the changes to the food guide? So uh, we actually participated in the launch of the food guide. Uh, I'm chair of Food Secure Canada, which is a pan-Canadian uh, bilingual organization that works to uh, support three interlocking goals of uh, healthy and safe food, sustainable food systems, and uh, zero hunger. And we were able to uh, work with uh, Health Canada and providing feedback. And I would actually argue that there have been a lot of positive feedback in terms of the process and the guidelines and the increased transparency in the process to um, advise and consult on the food guide. 45,000 Canadians participated in consultations to help put their input into shaping what this food guide looks like. I would say that this might not be a document that someone has on their fridge, but is definitely helping to contribute and shape um, what uh what uh, you know, Canadians are having on their plate. And I'd like to remind everyone that the food guide is one step. It's a cornerstone piece of, um, of policy, but it's not the only tool to think about uh, our food system and how things are being shaped. We need a food strategy. And I think Food Secure Canada worked very closely to, uh, like many other organizations, to ensure that uh, public policy was being put together um, in the interest of uh, the public and not in the interest solely of industry, which passed food guides arguably have. I'm um, ensuring that, you know, that this is a food guide that takes into account the health of Canadians and takes into account um, environmental impacts as well, to think through something comprehensive and holistic that addresses some of the key concerns that, uh, that we're facing. You mentioned 45,000 uh, Canadians, but that's, when you think about the country, that's like a tiny, tiny percentage of the country. If you think about public consultation processes, that's actually a very vast number. Um, most government consultations uh, only get a couple um, thousand people participating, so to have that kind of engagement uh, through a very short window process. This was swept through quite quickly uh, once this was announced in mandate letters. It's actually quite remarkable. And just to note that, you know, this is an issue, as I said, that isn't only about, you know, farmers and only about the environment, but this is also an issue that is really weighing on our, our system, right? You have uh, the highest number of deaths in Canada is actually diet related. You're thinking about uh, $13 billion a year that's crippling for provincial governments. And you're thinking about things that can be addressed Rest, where you're thinking about type 2 diabetes, you're thinking about some uh, cancer-related diets, uh, sorry, uh, cancer-related 
um, to diets. Uh, you're thinking about things like uh, cardiovascular disease. So these are things where we can get ahead of the game and actually have an impact. And I think it starts with, as Cecilia mentioned, uh, institutional procurement and thinking about what do we have in our public institutions, whether they be schools or hospitals, mm -hmm. to start to shape this, the food system holistically. And I think farmers have an opportunity to be a part of that change. Um, and I, Well, so your organization uh, deals with uh, youth. Why do you think it's important to engage youth in food policy? Well, I think there are a lot of reasons. I think the average young person doesn't necessarily always understand how policy is impacting their everyday. And let's face it, young people are the future that are going to be inheriting all of these decisions we're making now. And if we want these policies to be successful, young people need a seat at the table to make those decisions. And so, we, you know, look at farmers today. The average farmer is at the age 55 or older. So we need to clear the way to have space for young people to have access to capital and land and to resources to be able to adapt, to be able to continue continue farming, farming in a more sustainable way, farming in a way that also takes into account being able to put food on your own table. And I think that's what we're hearing from young people and that's what the food guide needs to be taking into account. And am I correct that your organization is the world's first youth food policy council? Yes, we are. Right here in Toronto. Right here in Toronto. That's fantastic. The notion that this population bomb has been over time gathering steam and will eventually at some point explode is about the most conventional wisdom going today and in fact you know you can go decades if not centuries into the past where did you get the notion that this might not be accurate well it was, it was in fact something that we had both been watching uh for 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 some years um this demographer and then that demographer and then that demographer william lutz i guess is the best known of them um in vienna um, and the, uh, we're, starting, we're saying, you know, they're just not taking into account this, and they're just not taking into account that. And when you do take into account this and that, you discover it doesn't get to 11 billion by the end of the century. It gets to around 9 billion by the middle of the century, and then it starts to go down. For the first time in human history, we will be, over time, deliberately culling ourselves by having fewer babies than we need to reproduce. Uh, and there are great things about that and bad things about that, and no, we're gonna talk about it, but uh, that is what this group, um, and I think a growing body of evidence in support of that group, uh, suggests is going to happen. We will go deeper on this, obviously, but is that essentially, in a nutshell, what it's about? In developed countries, we are having fewer children, and even in developing countries, they're having fewer children. Is that it? Well, the key to that, though, is in developing countries, because the mm -hmm. assumption is that what we're talking about in terms of uh, reduction in fertility in developed countries is, is a pretty well accepted fact now. I mean, you don't even have to go to the numbers, just look at your own families for, for the most part. I mean, there are some exceptions, uh, but uh, for the most part, people are having two kids or fewer. I mean, the, the fertility rate of Canada today is 1.6, but that matches all the Nordic countries, that matches all of Western Europe. And, and in fact, they got there faster, and now Europe is basically losing people every year. So. Everybody knows that, but 40% of the world's population lives in two places, India and China. And when you find out that China's got a birth rate of 1.5 and India has just been reported at a birth rate of 2.1, you sit back and say, well, maybe, maybe we're not going to explode. You guys are not setting a very good example. One kid? Correct. No kids? No kid. Well, you're not exactly uh, holding up your end of the bargain here, are you? But we're representative. You are representative, that is true. What have you found to be some of the major drivers of population decline? There's really just one uh, that matters more than any other, and it's urbanization. Hmm. Uh, when you move from the countryside to the city, a bunch of things happen that, that result in fewer children. And for the first time in history, um, we are now a species that lives mostly in cities. Uh, right now, 55% of humans live in cities. And Essentially, uh, what happens when you move to a city is a child stops being an asset and becomes a liability. I love the way you describe that in the book. When they're on the farm... It's another pair of hands to work in the fields, and <laughs> when you're in the city, it's just another mouth to feed. Yeah. And then another thing that's even as important, if not more important, when you move from the, from the countryside to the city, uh, women acquire education. They have access now to state um, school systems that they didn't have when they were in, out in the village. They have access to media. Um, uh, and they have access to other women. 
and they become better educated. And as soon as women become better educated, as soon as they have any kind of ability to control any aspects of their destiny, the first thing they demand is the right to have some control over their own bodies. And once women have some control over their own bodies, the first thing they decide to do is have fewer children. Mm -hmm. And it is urbanization that is leading to an acceleration in, birth, in, in the decline of birth rates throughout the developing world in some of the biggest countries in the developing world. The design of retirement homes today, how do you think 25 years from now we're going to regard them? So I often uh, think of how we regard that we institutionalize people with mental health, right? We put them, that's what we're going to think about that, you know, we didn't think that older adults could age in their homes. Mm -hmm. If you remember way back 10th century, first when people retired, we put them in alms houses, charities funded them, then nursing homes, then funeral homes. Mm -hmm. And so that whole um, equation is changing now because the next generation of older adults is not going to age uh, the way their, grand their parents did and their grandparents did. Why, in which case then, historically, have we designed the system the way we have designed it? We weren't living as long, number mm. one. So we went into a retirement home for a few years before we may have gone into a long-term care or nursing home and passed away. But now, with 30 years of longevity, the, the institutional model of retirement homes doesn't make any sense. And people want to be part of communities. They want to be part of neighborhoods. They want to, they want to be closer to different generations. So we're going to look back on retirement homes and say, that was a model that worked when we were living there for two or three years. But it's not a model that works for our oh, generation. Yes, yeah. Uh, who are aging. You'd almost add, you could challenge this word retirement. I mean, yes, Germany created definitely. it when the average age you know, of, of death was 65. So the age of retirement was 65, yes. but it's just not that anymore. Uh, Joseph Coughlin, who's kind of a guru on this from the MIT Aging Lab, mm -hmm. he says actually it's 28 years of life after retirement will be the norm. That's like, think about from zero to 28, how much happened in your life, mm -hmm. right? That's yes. an entire lifetime is now what used to happen in, yeah, four or five years. So yeah. you two are singularly responsible for redesigning the entire way we go forward from now. <laughs> Absolutely. And so you're both gonna have to tell me where, how, how are the designs for senior living going forward going to have to change? Start us off. Well, uh, it, my, my premise is this. We will not change the designs of the, the models for seniors unless we, and I now am 60, uh, boomers, actually engage in the thinking of what we want. We need to co-design the solutions. Mm -hmm. We can't wait for the suppliers to generate the options for us. We have to step in, we have to nudge ourselves, we have to get use our 60s to think about our 80s. And so uh, sustaining ourselves into our 80s and thriving is, 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 is fair as saying, we're not going to retire. The essence of successful aging is actually contributing. So how are we going to contribute? Well, we're not going to contribute by living in an institutional setting. Mm -hmm. we're, going to, we're going to contribute by customizing the neighborhoods we want to live in and contributing to the operating of those neighborhoods and, uh, and helping one another. Caregiving is the future. We're going to rely on our friends as well as family members and neighbors as caregivers. We're going to receive and give help. So we have to co-design. We have to step in. Okay, and let me that's find hard out more to do. That. What do those new, yeah. newly designed collaborative neighborhoods look like? So I'll give a few uh, examples. So I'm a future strategist. We spend our time looking all over the world to see how others are adapting to aging and then figuring out what can't translate here, testing them with people and their families. Uh, we actually are writing a book called The Future of Aging. I'll be, we'll be back on this show, Steve, to talk <laughs> mm -hmm. about it. Chapter one of The Future of Aging book uh, is called The Future of Senior Living Communities. So in there, we outlined these eight kind of concepts that are emerging that we're seeing in Europe and uh, in California and a few pockets of Canada. So just a couple examples. Please. You know, one is like dementia villages, right? Mm -hmm. Or other villages where the whole city is for a population that has some common feature. It could be autism, it could be disability. These have been around 25, 30 years in the Netherlands. I just understand this. Does that mean everybody who lives in that village has autism or dementia? Yeah, or dementia, or yeah. Yeah, and we've had delegations from Canada go down and visit these, mm -hmm. particularly in Denmark, uh, in the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. The first dementia village in Canada is opening up in British Columbia, and the first in the United States just opened in California. So we're about two decades <laughs> behind. Yeah. It's a very interesting concept where you rethink everything, the built environment, the housing, the, the care, shared. 
everything. That's just one of these kind of eight concepts we explore in our book. Let's see how it worked at the Ontario Legislature. When you were a member there, yeah. did you ever find yourself, Jennifer, having a strong yet civilized debate with a member of the other side, uh, maybe away from the cameras, but you thought, oh, this person actually is a person and I can have a civilized conversation with them? Absolutely. It happened all the time. And I think to Tim's point, it still happens all the time. And to Marco's point, uh, some of it is the inflammatory language that is used for the theater of question period. Mm -hmm. And that's what ends up on social media. And then you get the paid or unpaid trolls diving in there with the more manipulative conversation and fueling and cultivating um, a polarization in that anonymous world of social media. Mm -hmm. And that's dangerous. And I, it's interesting because well, we as politicians may be able to step away from the theater and have really productive conversations in the hallways or in caucus. I still think they should put cameras in caucus so people could see how <laughs> passionate MPPs that. are, where they really do take <laughs> on their role. Some pushback there. <laughs> I know, but uh, but there are good passionate moments, as as Marco said. But uh, we're losing that, and it's 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 seeping into a broader culture. There's a survey that was just done recently in the states. Of, of partisanship, on partisanship, and Republicans and Democrats were saying that they, they are getting to the point where they are identifying them so much, labeling themselves so much mm. as one or the other, that they don't really even want to intermingle. Hmm. There's clearly, Tim, a huge disconnect here between the way you tell us you interact when the cameras are not on and the way you all perform when the cameras are on and question period and you need to get your clip on the news that night. Yeah. What do we do about that? So I, I mean, I was never there in, in BC, right? The before camera era, you talk <laughs> to some of those veterans and they say things were calmer. I actually think they're probably hammered half the time and that's why they were calmer before cameras. Maybe not half the time. I, <laughs> I, um, I think two things, for, for government members to make this work better, I want to see a premier or a prime minister who has the courage and confidence to let them vote against the party line, actually represent their constituents. So if, if Glenn feels everybody from Medicine Hat, from where Andrew Scheer wants to go, let him vote that way, right? We make too much of a fuss about that. That will strengthen the role of members of the assembly who aren't in cabinet. And then for opposition members, I mean, the less power opposition has, I, I think the more of a divide that you have. My best days that I enjoyed the most truthfully were the minority parliament. And it actually make deals. What you said mattered. Or when there's private members' bills, that matters because you don't know which way the vote is going to go. Mm -hmm. If you want to empower members and improve collegiality, empower the opposition and the members who are not in cabinet on the government side. What prime minister? Steve, can Mark I just jump yeah, in quickly on I was that point? You would, just, uh, no, I think Tim makes a, a really important point on giving more free reign to uh, backbenchers, members without a portfolio who aren't in cabinet, uh, more independence. And certainly in our government, we have seen uh, backbenchers routinely uh, vote in a, in a manner that is not necessarily consistent with the adopted government position. And we, Prime Minister has set some basic ground rules on when that can happen. And I do think that with more independence uh, comes more integrity and transparency and accountability to your own constituents. So look, if you're not running afoul of legislation that would be, um, you know, consistent with the charter. Um, you know, you should be given uh, some some fairly wide latitude to to represent the viewpoints of your constituency, and certainly that's something our government has tried to do. If I can just add, uh, one of the things that I've really appreciated uh, since uh, you know coming into uh, into Parliament is that. Um, you know, I have a voice in our caucus, and I can stand up and say what I need to say, and I can vote my conscience and, and what I believe to be the best interest of uh, my constituents, and I'm encouraged to do that. And yet, you know, I, I don't want to disagree with Marco all the time, but uh, you know, we've seen we've seen what's happened when members of the current government have voted. Uh, what they felt was best for their constituency, and they've been chastised for it, which is unfortunate. And but I would agree that that uh, you know there, there's some benefit to what you're suggesting, Jennifer. I was just going to jump in and say something similar: is that that's the role of the MPP, as opposed to the role of the partisan uh, player. It is a partisan game, and it is a team sport. But if you remember the role, why you're there, you are the voice of your constituents, and private members' time is a very favorite time. Sam Osterhoff, the man who replaced us in Niagara West Glambrook, um, he said he loves private members' time, and he's rocking it as an MPP. By the way, I'm going to throw him a plug in there. Uh, but, but it is because he's representing his constituents, and, and they are able to voice those interests. That's why they were sent there. 
let's say that the issues that you raise in the book are not addressed adequately in the way that you would like to see right. them. Dissent is stifled. There is no opportunity to discuss these things and so on. Over the next 50 years, how do you see us rolling out? Well, I think that that will lead to polarization. And so I think... Worse I than now? Seems pretty bad now. It will, yes, I think it could get bad. It could get worse. Um, I think the U.S. is where you see that sort of stifling going on within the Democratic Party, which is actually, I think, worsening polarization. Now, the Republicans are off the deep end, too, but I think we have to get to a position where, I say in the book, we can discuss immigration rates as calmly and rationally as tax rates. And with tax rates, you know, yes, you might want more, you might, might want less. The people who want less, you don't simply demonize as the worst people on earth and vice versa. So I think we need to get to a, a position where we can have that calm discussion. And then people will say, I want it a lot less, but they want more, so we've met in the middle. And I can accept that, you know. I think that is the way to kind of diffuse some of this. It's never going to be, no one's ever going to get exactly <laughs> what they want. And actually, the European mainstream parties are, are adapting, I would say. I mean, the left-wing parties in, in many countries are saying, yes, we have to talk about this issue. Uh, we have to sort of accommodate this to some degree. And that's fine. I think that is a healthy way to proceed. When you actually throw a, a wrench into the works and say, no, this is off the table, we can't have a democratic discussion, I think you build up pressure and it gets expressed and sublimated in ways we can't predict. I mean, Brexit is one example of Well, that. Brexit's one example, yeah. but at least it was a democratic vote. Are you anticipating more white terrorism going forward? I don't. I'm very against scaremongering and manipulating of fear, So, and, and, and I tend to believe in the sort of St Stephen Pinker argument that we are moving towards a less violent society. I think you will just get <sighs> polarization. So in the US, the Democrats may win elections, but the Senate may be, because it's based on a territorial principle, which is, you know, whites tend to be more spread across the United States, the Senate will go Republican in the governor's mansions, and you'll get this sort of standoff between rural or, or, or the, the whiter parts of America and the federal government. And, and that's just going to be an unhealthy state of affairs. You would rather have a situation where each, you know, where people can find compromise and work to solve problems in a rational way. Sure, that's what yeah. everybody wants, right. but the fact right. is that, that uh, I mean, they call it a balkanization for a reason, right. and it was only 25 years ago the Balkans exploded. Can you imagine that happening in the United States? I don't, I mean, it's, it's obviously anything's possible, and I know some people are predicting civil war in the U.S. I'm more skeptical of these claims. I just don't think people, res you may get some terrorism, you may get a slight uptick in, in far-right terrorism. I'm reluctant to say there's going to be civil war, although I know there are people who, who argue that. Does war, in a weird way, bring people together? It does have a clarifying effect. It's awful, but it can have a clarifying effect, right? Right, it absolutely does. So if, if the U.S. was invaded, then their polarization would be gone. And there, there's, there are even experiments that show when you talk about an alien invasion of, of Earth, have people read that paragraph, then a lot of their attitudes shift on these matters and become more conciliatory. So, yeah, there's no question, and we've seen it in history in the U.S., you know, the Second World War really kind of ended anti-Semitism in a very large way, which was actually quite strong in the 20s and 30s. And similarly, the Civil War kind of took away a lot of the anti-Irish prejudice that was there in the 1850s, mm -hmm. so... Yeah. That is the Agenda's Week in Review for this Friday, February the 15th, 2019. You can pick up on all those discussions at tvo.org, on our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash the agenda, and on our Twitter feed, twitter.com slash the agenda. The Agenda with Steve Bacon is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. Helping businesses stay on the right side of change with strategic thinking, insightful decisions, and business leadership. Are you on the right side of change? Ask an Ontario CPA.